It's been a while since we had our last session in Christian parenting by the book, and I plan to consistently do this during our family fellowship nights as what we are addressing is really training your child for Christ in a Romans 1 culture. And for many parents, training your child for Christ in a Romans 1 culture seems like mission impossible. But as I've shared with you before, like everything else in the Christian life, we are reminded that when it comes to Christian parenting, 2 Corinthians 3, 5 also applies. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Amen? Amen. In our previous lessons, we have considered several other important issues if you want to be involved in Christian parenting by the book. In lesson one, we looked at how you must understand your assignment from God. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. It's summarized in that verse, and you fathers or parents, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. In lesson two, we looked at the advantages of a Christian home and the challenges of a Romans 1 culture. And there are many advantages that you are giving your child by being raised in not merely a home where there are Christians, but in a truly Christian home. Because we're living in a Romans 1 culture, and if you do not know what I mean, read Romans 1, 18 through 32. Lesson number three was on the divine factor in parenting. And having a holy and happy home is not the product of human invention or ingenuity. It's designed and built by God and his word. In lesson number four, we looked at, is your home child-centered? And in this lesson, we observe the peril of letting your child be the center of your home instead of the Lord first, then your marriage, so that your children's natural selfishness and self-centeredness are not reinforced, but that he finds his secure and stable place under your authority and love so that he doesn't continue to think that he's the center of the universe. And then in lesson number five, we looked at how to lead your child to Christ for salvation. And how important is that? And yet many parents catechize their children instead of evangelizing them due to their reformed traditions. Others share the gospel, but in a false and inaccurate way, telling them to pray a prayer, ask Jesus into their heart, or something else, instead of teaching them both the context and content of the gospel and encouraging them to choose to believe in Jesus Christ and his finished work. And then as a follow-up to that, in lesson number six, we looked at how to help your child grow spiritually. As the objective isn't merely to know Jesus Christ, but to grow in grace and learn one's position and possessions and privileges in Christ, how to walk by faith and how to serve Jesus Christ. And as an ambassador for Christ, how to represent him and share the gospel with others. Now, all of this brings us to our lesson tonight, number seven, what does your child really need? And I'm planning to cover this question in probably three lessons. So let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. My heart goes out to the parents of our church, the parents of this generation. In so many ways, as every generation is getting further and further removed from the biblical perspective on a family, and even what's involved in child training. And as I've said before, there was a time in yesteryear where even the village idiot knew more Bible than most evangelical Christians today. And they even understood some basic principles about child training that so often is missing in the thinking of people today, partly because people have departed from the word of God. And we've allowed the world's thinking and values to shape our mind, determine and dictate to us how we should view marriage, how we should view the family, how we should view the nation, how we should view the church, how to view Jesus Christ how to view the word of God, and so forth. And so in this series of lessons here on training your child for Christ, we're going back to the book. 
We're going back to the book of all books. We're going back to the Bible. We're going back to the original design. We're going back to God's perspective. And we're seeking to glean scriptural principles and then make applications that are relative to your life as a parent or as a grandparent. In Psalm 127 in verse 1, it's kind of our capstone verse for the whole series. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. We saw in a previous lesson that to enjoy family divine style, your architect and constructor must be the Lord. And the word for Lord here is Yahweh, the the strong, promise-keeping, faithful God. And the Lord must be allowed to be your architect and constructor of your home if you want it built his way. We also notice that the word build implies that for you to have a family that's built God's way involves a deliberate process. A construction crew, if they're going to build a house well, have a, a blueprint. And then they need to go through the process of carefully knowing and consistently applying the blueprint to the situation as homes or houses are not built overnight and neither are families. Thirdly, we notice the necessity of divine construction in your family is underscored by the word unless. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain to build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And that means the divine factor in your marriage and home is not optional. It's imperative. It's not a maybe. It is a must. Then we notice the word they. And that reminds us of the necessity of both parents, if possible, participating in this important endeavor. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And this is a challenge for many today. Due to divorce, due to an absentee dad or mom, due to death, due to deployment, and so forth. But in the ideal, this process involves both parents who both know the Lord and are willing to know and follow God's blueprint. And that's another reason why you're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers when it comes to choosing your marriage mate. A fifth thing we noticed was the word labor. And this indicates that you must have active involvement in this process. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. You know, it's, it's been said before, no deposit, no return. And while the Christian life involves active dependence but passive production, as we must abide in Christ for him to produce his fruit through us, we are nevertheless the instruments. We're nevertheless the branches. We're the active participants, as no one else can really fulfill what God has assigned to us by way of our home. A sixth thing we noticed was the alternative to divine construction in your family is that you will labor in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain, who builds it, and it's repeated at the end of the verse as well. Is that what you want? A home that was attempted to be built, but ended up in vain. How much better to do God's way, or God's will, God's way, according to God's word, through God's power, for God's glory, leaving the results with God. And when that's the case, it will never be ultimately in vain. And then number seven, we notice the practical blessings that God grants you occurs when he builds your home and you let him do this by fearing the Lord and faithfully following his instructions. And we looked at Psalm 128 for this. And by fearing the Lord, we just mean standing in awe, taking him seriously, recognizing for who he is and responding to him as a result. Now today we're going to look at what does your child really need. Now by that I mean what do they really need according to God. And I say that because the world is telling us what your children need. And yet what they tell us and what God tells us 
that's vastly different. So let's begin by understanding your child. What is God's view of your child? And then as a result, what is your perspective when it comes to your child? First of all, God says your child is an assignment from God. An assignment from God. You can see there in verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The word heritage can mean property. It can mean possession, depending on the context. In other words, in a sense, your children are on loan from God. Not only was Rush Limbaugh on loan from God, so were your children. You ever heard him talk how he was always on loan from God, right? They're your God-given assignment. And I can't underscore enough the importance of having this perspective when parenting children and how needed that is in a day in which many forsake their parenting assignment for something else. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be involved in something else. And in some cases, this becomes very challenging, especially if you are a single parent. But when God gives you a child or children, they're an assignment from him. They're a possession that God assigns to you for not merely what you can do for them, but what they can do for you. And that certainly has been true in our lives with Nancy and myself, as God has used our children in ways to mature us, to challenge us, to expose us, our weaknesses, and to expand us as parents in so many ways that only children can do. And while the world will applaud you, When you forsake your parenting responsibility and you turn your kids over to the state to train, you need to remember that your child is an assignment from God. Secondly, we see in this passage, he's a gift from God. Now, it's interesting for it says the fruit of the womb is a reward. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And you know, there's some debate or discussion about that word reward, whether it really means reward or does it mean a gift? And obviously, the two are vastly different. You see, it's kind of ironic because, in a sense, it's not that you earn children. I mean, let's face it, if that was true, there would be a lot less children in the world. On the other hand, it seems to have the idea of something that's freely given by a gracious giver. In other words, children are not an accident from God's perspective. Though they may surprise you, I can still remember the day Nancy brought the ultrasound picture back after three months or whatever and showed me. I can still visualize the whole thing. And she says, look at this. And I looked. Twins. Twins. I know we have a baseball team, the Minnesota Twins, but twins. That was incredible. But what was a surprise to me was a divine appointment from God. And therefore, your child's not a boo-boo. He's a blessing. And you can be very thankful to the Lord for each one of your children. By the way, the ability to not have children doesn't mean God is punishing you either, as some people took that perspective in yesteryear. So God says your child is an assignment from God, a gift from God, thirdly, an arrow in your quiver. We read there in verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. And the reason he says one's youth is that's during your childbearing years, unless your name is Abraham or Sarah. And when you think about arrows, arrows need to be made. (laughs) They need to be molded. They need direction. As it were, you shoot them in a certain direction. An arrow isn't really of any use unless, in a sense, it's directed in a certain direction and has an objective. And in the same way, your child, in a sense, can go places that you are not able to go. They can go farther in some ways than you've been able to go. And if you've been involved in their parenting, and you're responding to the Lord, you can be used of the Lord, as it were, to to direct them in the right direction. And they need desperately direction. When I think of my own children, or our own children, I think of the potential opportunity they had. 
You see, I wasn't raised in a Christian home, a truly Christian home. I was raised in a religious home. And our children have had the opportunity since before they could even speak to be able to hear verses, songs, and then be trained up not only from Christian parents, but in a Christian church that's teaching the word of God and so forth. But one of the problems is familiarity can breed contempt to spiritual blessings and advantages. So you need to view your child as an arrow in your quiver. Now, sometimes people ask me, how many arrows are in the quiver? Or how many should we have? And you know, and obviously, that's an individual thing between you and the Lord and your mate per se. I will tell you this, if God wants you to have a child, you're going to have a child. And if he chooses you not to, you're not going to. Now, I understand there's a human element to this, and there's a human responsibility side to it, but ultimately, God is in control. And how precious those children are, aren't they? I tell Sarah this often. I tell her, you are so precious to us. We just love you so much. We're so thankful God gave you to us. So God says your child is... Also, number four, a sinner. By nature and filled with foolishness. This is the result of the fall. This is the result of Adam's sin. And then, as a result, the passing on of that sin nature down through the ages. Psalm 51.5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now, I want you to notice the word conceived me. At conception, they are a me. A person is a person at conception. It's not on the first breath you take. That is a baby in the womb. In fact, it's interesting because the word brephos, which is a word for baby, was used of John the Baptist in the womb, and it was used of John the Baptist out of the room, womb, because a baby is a baby. Now, while you're, it's close, turn to the right to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. And I want you to find verse 15. Verse 15. We see there in Psalm 51... That children are born sinners. And by the way, I've heard people say, well, children are just like wet cement. All you have to do is mold them. And I would like to suggest to you, they're like wet cement with some big rocks in it. They have a self-will. They are selfish. They are stubborn. They're very rebellious by nature. And don't be the kind of parents who's always excusing your child, who's always coddling instead of correcting your child. You know, I've known parents who have had an excuse for every time their child misbehaves, and it's usually the other person's fault. And not teaching your child to take personal responsibility. And even if it was the other kid's fault, it's a teachable moment to teach them how they should respond when they've been done wrong. Responding right when they've been done wrong. But you're going to not only teach them that verbally if you're on the stick, but you're going to teach them it by example. As some things are caught, not merely taught. And they're going to watch how you handle situations. When you have a trial, and if you blow off the, you this and this and this, or do you turn to the Lord? Do you respond to him by faith? Do you rest in his promise? And even if you do react, you say, you know what? That was the wrong reaction. I should have responded, I reacted, and I'm willing to admit that. You see, in Proverbs 22, verse 15, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. So foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, as it were. So important for us to Remember that. Now, if foolishness is bound in the heart of child, I'd like to ask you a question. If that's the case, why do you let them make so many decisions when they're young? You know, the decision they really need to learn is children obey your parents and the Lord. They're too young to make decisions. That's why you don't reason with kids. You think kids are reasonable? They're not reasonable. They're foolish. We see this right here. 
And as a result, you give them commands. You expect they will carry that out. If they do, you give them praise. If they don't, you give them discipline. And please note, I didn't say punishment. I don't believe that parents punish their kids. They discipline their kids. Discipline's done out of love. Punishment is done out of justice. Big difference. Discipline is done for their good. Punishment is done because something legally was done, and as a result, there is this repercussion or consequence that isn't designed for your good at all, as it were. And as a result, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. And when we're done with looking over what your child really needs, we're going to move on to a few lessons on child training by way of discipline, which seems to be very misunderstood in our day. So we see this, that this is what your child is like. And by the way, thinking of letting them make the decisions, they're going to choose the chocolate every time. Have you ever figured that out yet? You let them, do you want it to have, you know, carrots or chocolate? You know, almost every time, unless they're really different, as they were. A fifth description of your child is that little bambino who is a gift from God, an assignment from God, an arrow in your quiver, a sinner by nature and filled with foolishness. They are fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you go back with me to Psalm 139, this is a wonderful psalm, as it is. They're fearfully and wonderfully made. The idea here is that God has a personal design in their life, even by way of physical factors, as we'll see. Now, I know that sin can play a part in this. Unfortunately, there are children that are born with fetal alcohol syndrome, or they're born with drug addiction because of the sinful choices of their mother, as it were, which then became the instrument by which those drugs were put into their system and all the impact of that. We know that is very, very sad. But we know that they're fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at verse 14. The psalmist says, I will praise you. Why? For I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Someone has said when they look like your mother or father-in-law, they're fearfully made. When they look like you, they're wonderfully made. (laughs) I'm just joking. But one thing is true, God is sovereign, isn't he? Isn't he sovereign in so many things? Hair color, skin color, size, shape, capabilities, so many things that come into play. And that's why even when they come out in their whatever gender they come out, oh, I wanted a boy. Can you imagine how crumbling that would be to a child to hear that kind of thing? In fact, I know of a true life story where this family wanted a girl. Instead, came out a boy. So they dressed him up like a boy. I mean, a girl. He was ridiculed by the kids, all these things. Went out in the boondocks of northern Minnesota. He was a lumberjack, unloved, uncared for. And someone came and gave him the gospel. They got saved. He had never heard of someone who would just unconditionally love him like Jesus Christ did. And he heard the gospel, and he ended up getting saved by the grace of God before he died. Our children are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we want to appreciate that. We want to thank the Lord for that. And that's why you can accept your children the way they are. And again, though, there's factors that come into play, like our daughter with special needs, obviously due to the fall, and other factors that came into play there. Number six, God says your child is unique, unique. There's one of a kind. They're like a snowflake, as it were. You say, well, what if you have identical twins? They're still unique, as it were. 
Now look at verse 15 with me. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret in the womb and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Figure of speech for the womb. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me when as yet they were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Wow. How could evolution ever explain the development of a child in the womb and all that's involved in order to make that possible? Our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made and they're being fearfully and wonderfully made within the womb of someone who was fearfully and wonderfully made as well. They're unique. Each one's different. And as a result, you need to appreciate them for who they are. Number seven, God says your child also is of intrinsic value and is not to be abused. Of intrinsic value and is not to be abused. Abuse. I'd like you to go to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Now we know in Genesis, on the sixth day, God created male and female. We have, as it were, the blow-by-blow explanation of the creation week in Genesis 1. We have day six developed and expanded as it were, in chapter 2. And in Genesis chapter 1, we read, Then God said, Let us make man, notice the word us, as God is a trinity, make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Notice, being created in the image of God, they have intrinsic value. In fact, later in Genesis, chapter 9, after the flood, when God designed human government, that divine institution, he said, whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God, he created them. You see, people have intrinsic value, as it were. And they're not to be abused. Now, if you look at Matthew chapter 18 with me, we read in verse 6 these words. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, because we live in a sin-cursed world. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. You see, as we think of this, we hear of all kinds of abuse. There's sexual abuse, there's human trafficking, there's incest, there's abortion, which is the ultimate abuse, and such. And you know, my heart goes out to mothers who have aborted their children. And in some cases, they come to faith and they feel guilty about that. And, and obviously, it was before they were saved in many cases. And you know, they're forgiven, but there's, I'm sure there's a deep sense of regret. And it's even difficult at times to even hear about it. I understand that. I try to be wise about that. I don't make that the unpardonable sin. But on the other hand, let's face the reality of millions of children in our country who are being aborted, murdered, without a choice. And then they call it pro-choice. Well, they, the, the baby in the womb has no choice at all. You see, God says, be better than a millstone be hung around someone's neck than abusing those little ones. Number eight, God says your child is born with gender and purpose. Gender and purpose. Now, I need to mention this by virtue of the incredible confusion in our day. As Satan attacks the first 11 chapters of Genesis, especially the early chapters, and one of the reflections of a, of a society that rejects the truth of God and replaces with a lie 
is one, evolution instead of creation. Number two, gender confusion. Because those are in chapters one and two of the book of Genesis. I mean, right at the beginning. But Satan knows what he's attacking. And we need to be aware of it as well, for we know, again, then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Notice, they were created with purpose. In addition, the verses right before, which we already noted, he made them male and female. By the way, there's only two genders. I mean, it's not difficult. And you know what's really ironic is the very people who say there's multiple genders, when it came to COVID, told us to follow the science. Duh. How about following the science here? But you see, it's an agenda. And it's a lie that Satan is perpetuating, per se. And so this gives us some idea of how we should view our children. And by the way, I want to say this to you parents here. I really encourage you to go home. And the next day or two, I want you to read this list. And I want you to have a conversation about it, about viewing your children in this kind of way. And how should this impact you? and being reminded of this. Because, you know, I don't want you to just come. Now you filled in eight slots, as it were, and you're going to go home and do nothing about it. So let me end by saying, how does this perspective affect your parenting? First of all, number one, it affects your perspective of them under all and varied circumstances. It affects your perspective of them under all and varied circumstances, like when every hole is leaky when they just puked all over the blankets, when they embarrassed you in public. It's really important to remember this is the gift from God. And, and by the way, he doesn't take it back, okay? This is an assignment from the Lord that God is using it to mature you as well. They're fearfully and wonderfully made. They are not a boo-boo. They are not a bother. They are not a blister. They are a blessing. And you know when parents yell, oh, we didn't plan or want you anyhow, what a devastating effect Amen. those words would have on your child. Your child is not a casualty. Your child is not a tragedy. Your child is a heritage, a gift, an arrow. They are precious and they are unique. Secondly, it affects your training of them with different personalities. You see, in every case, they're sinners, so therefore, there are certain things that are necessary for all children. I mean, they're just across the board, regardless of the personality, regardless of the gift mix and so forth. This is just stuff you have to do by way of training. On the other hand, due to personalities and due to giftedness and so forth, there's things you need to be aware of as a parent. And this is where wisdom is going to come in. This is where it's going to be necessary to get to know your children. You know, and, and they're going to vary. You know, some are going to be more stoic. Some are going to be more emotional. Some are going to be this. Some are going to be that. Some are going to be more prone to athletics. Some will be like they can't even shoot a ball. it will be all of that. You know what? You want to be aware of that. I knew early on that our son Ian was never going to be an athlete. I just knew it. Now, I could have trained him more probably to be a decent athlete. But I, I kind of gave up early on. Instead, he became an engineer and a pianist. So, <laughs> hey, we won. You know, praise the Lord. Number three, it affects their self-concept and sense of worth and belonging. And I say that because you don't want your children to feel like they were just simply an extra that they feel rejected, they didn't feel unconditionally loved or accepted by the most significant people in their life. And you know, there's people today, and it could be you, that to this day feel wounded in ways in light of how your parents failed to love you and accept you, maybe ridiculed you and such. I want you to know this, that you can either think and have your identity in Adam and go back to that, or you can see yourself in Christ. You can see yourself as a new creation in Christ. You can see yourself loved, accepted, eternally secure in Christ. 
You can see yourself forgiven and redeemed in Christ. You can begin to allow the word of Christ to change your whole perspective about life, including yourself. And those very things that were hurtful to you in the past, the Lord can even use to show you you're not sufficient, rely on him, and even to be sensitive towards people who maybe have gone through the same thing. Because by now, it's a Romans 8.28. And do you know something about the Apostle Paul? Sometimes people don't recognize this. That, you know, after he was saved and he grew for a while, if you read Galatians chapter 1, the second half of it, you know where he was sent? Back to the churches of Judea who were in Christ. That's where he had persecuted. That's where he had drugged people off to prison. That's where he had done all kinds of things before he was saved. How was he able to do that? How was he able to deal with it? How was he able to? Because he saw himself forgiven and in Christ. And it created a humility in his life, a dependence on the Lord. And that was the assignment the Lord gave him. And you know what? The Lord used him mightily. How the world would view as a negative became a positive when he responded and walked by faith. And the same can be true for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your wonderful word. What a joy it is to think about these things. And Father, we want to thank you for the children you've given to us and our grandchildren as well. They, we know they are a gift from you. They are a heritage of the Lord. They're an assignment. We know they're fearfully and wonderfully made. We know they're like arrows that need direction and care. We know, Father, that they're never to be abused. We know they are instead to be trained up in the nurture and admonition of you. We know our desire should be for them to come to know Jesus Christ, even at a young age, and then grow to love him because he first loved. Even as parents, Father, may again we realize we're co-crucified, co-buried, co-risen in Christ. We've died to sin. We're alive to God. Our history in Adam has ceased. We are now in Christ. And we are there now to walk in a newness of life as a new creation in Christ with a new power source and a new old potential and we know it's all because of your grace, and it's all because of the work of Christ, and it's all because he who hath begun a good work in us now will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And we can't thank you enough for this. And Father, we know there are still many areas of adjustment and growth in all of our lives. And Father, even as we look back on our parenting, we can see by your grace positives, and we can see some things that we failed in. And yet, on the other hand, we can all roll it on you. We can pray for our children. We can love our children. We can tell them that repeatedly. We can keep pointing them to Jesus Christ. For every generation must make up their own mind, as you have no grandchildren, only children. And so, Father, we pray for all of that. And you know the needs of everyone's heart here tonight. And pray that you would minister to it. In Jesus' name.